Hey guys, Curious Monkey here. Today we are going to talk about the anatomy of the inner ear. So, the inner ear has two main parts, the bony labyrinth and the membranous labyrinth. Here you can see that this blue color, the blue color represents the membranous labyrinth. Okay, so this is the membranous labyrinth, whereas the pink color is the bony labyrinth, bony part. Okay, so now let's talk about the membranous labyrinth first. Now the membranous labyrinth has three semicircular canals the superior, the posterior, and the lateral semicircular canal, whereas there is a utricle and a saccule, okay, and a cochlea, this cochlea, whereas the bony labyrinth has the same structures, that is, the three semicircular canals, and instead of having utricle and saccule, it has one structure known as the vestibule, and then the bony cochlea, right, so that is the structure for the inner ear, now let's go on to the development of the inner ear. The inner ear starts from the hindbrain, okay? If this is the hindbrain, what happens is that there is ectodermal thickening, right? There is ectodermal thickening and this ectodermal thickening becomes a placard. A placard like this, the thickening becomes the placard and then this placard invaginates like this and after some time it will get detached and become a auditory vesicle. Okay, so this auditory vesicle then differentiates itself and reforms and forms the membranous labyrinth. Okay, whereas surrounding this auditory vesicle, right, surrounding the auditory vesicle, the mesenchyme, the mesenchyme around the around this becomes the bony labyrinth. Okay, so now this membranous labyrinth or the auditory the cycle is like a ball shape so what happens is that it reforms itself it redesigns itself to form what we see that is the three semicircular canals right and the utricle the saccule and the cochlea right so that is what we see and the mesenchyme which is surrounding the membranous labyrinth is going to reform itself again and cover the whole membranous labyrinth and is known as the bony labyrinth okay so that is the development of the inner ear now this whole thing is not an empty space it is filled with fluids that is the membranous labyrinth inside is filled with endolymph endolymph okay now this endolymph is similar to the intracellular fluid so that means that it has more of potassium ions whereas the perilymph which is situated between the membranous labyrinth and the bony labyrinth, the perilymph has more of sodium ion because it represents like the extracellular fluid. Okay, so because of the difference between the ions and all, so there is a potential difference, potential gradient and that is plus 80 millivolts. Okay, and this is known as the endocochlear potential. This is helpful in the transmission of the uh, sound like our auditory uh, waves and all so this is helpful in that now the endolymph and the perilymph they have to be drained somewhere right so this endolymph they have a connection uh, for the drainage of the endolymph there is a connection of the utricle and the saccule now the utricle and the saccules connection combine with each other to form the endolymph endolymphatic duct okay now this endolymphatic duct does not have an end it just ends some something like this in the endolymphatic sac it's known as the endolymphatic sac right so and this sac lies in the subdural space subdural okay similar to this there is the drainage for the perilymph the perilymph has a another duct known as the cochlear aqueduct right so the cochlear aqueduct is going to drain the perilymph and it drains it into the subarachnoid space subarachnoid space right so that is the drainage for the endolymph as well as the perilymph so now moving on let's talk about the auditory system first right so as we know that the sound is conducted from the tympanic membrane to the ossicles and to the oval window here this is the oval window and here this is the round window right from the oval window the sound goes to a compartment known as the scala vestibule and where the scala vestibule will end is known as the helicotremor, right? And now, where the scala vestibule ends, 
there is a, another compartment it starts and it is known as the scalar tympani right and the scalar tympani ends at the round window and in between these two is the scalar media right so scalar media is somewhat like this so now if i tell you to do a cut section of these three compartments right so if i take a cut section like this now imagine this is the scalar um, the whole thing right so i ask you to take a cut section like this where i have taken like this so i have taken a cut section like this and then i point it towards you like this right so the result which we are going to get is somewhere like this so now the pink one which was the scalar vestibule and then the green one which is the scalar media right and the black one which is the scalar tympani so i hope it makes sense to you right now because i used to face a lot of trouble understanding this structure now as you can see here the scalar vestibule and the scalar tympani is both filled with perilymph whereas the scalar media will be filled with endolymph now as i told you that it is filled with endolymph this endolymph is produced by a structure known as the stria vascularis here on the lateral side of the scalar media is the stria vascularis where it produces the endolymph whereas the perilymph is believed to be produced by the ultra filtration of the blood or it is believed that it is somewhat similar to the csf so these are the two theories for the perilymph but the endolymph is produced by the stria vascular so now have you ever wondered why this cochlea is shaped like this well it's because that it is coiled around a structure now what is this structure known as this structure is known as modulus okay it's a pyramid like structure and the cochlea it's if this is the modulus then the cochlea is going to be coiled around like this right so the cochlea takes around 2 and a half to 2.75 turns of itself around the modulus now why is understanding this very important is because the modulus gives out a branch like structure known as osseous spiral lamellae okay now imagine if this is the cochlea coiling around like this then this structure that is the osseous spiral lamellae is going to give out the nerve supply nerve supply and as well as the blood supply okay so that is why it is very important and one more important thing is that as you can see here this is the osseous spiral lamellae and imagine it to be like this the modulus right so the osseous spiral lamellae as you can see here is attached to the basement membrane so it provides a support for the basement membrane also so that is important now moving on to the structure of the organ of cotai now the organ of cotai has two main hair cells that is the outer hair cells and the inner hair cells right and two structural important cells that is the cells of dators and pillar cells these are the two structures which is supporting the hair cells now the outer hair cell is cylindrical in shape whereas the inner hair cell is funnel in shape now the outer hair cells has no fibers which are mostly efferent okay whereas the inner hair cells have mostly efferent hair cells and the outer hair cells are more in number okay and because they lie out like more outwards they are more prone to damage whereas the inner hair cells are less in number and as they lie inwards they are like less prone to damage so those are the main differences for the outer and the inner hair cells now as you can see this is a gelatinous mass like structure known as the tectorial membrane so from the hair cells the hairs which are like this hair bundles now the most tallest hairs hair 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 particle or hair is known as the kinocilia okay whereas the others are known as the sterocilia so these hair particles are like attached to the tectorial membrane and when these tectorial mem uh, when this tectorial membrane move these hair follicles move and it leads to the depolarization or repolarization of the hair cells and the signal is transmitted through the nerves so that is how the sound is produced so as you can see this is the external auditory canal right and this is the tympanic membrane now 
the sound is going to be transferred from the tympanic membrane to the ossicles and then the oval window and towards the cochlea right as the sound is coming from the air medium and the middle ear is also filled with air medium but the inner ear is filled with endolymph and perilymph right so it is a liquid medium it should have been the sound which is transferred should have been decreased but that is not the case why is that is because of the presence of a mechanism known as impedance matching right so this impedance matching has two main things the two main things are saying that as you can see the tympanic membrane which has 19 millimeter square of surface area has only about 55 millimeter square of effective surface area that means the part which is really compliant or movable right whereas your oval window which has this tape foot plate of stapes on it so this only has 3.2 millimeter square of surface area so if we divide 55 upon 3.2 then you'll get around 17 right so that is it and the ossicles have a le lever ratio now the lever ratio is that the handle of the malleus is around 1.3 whereas the long process of the incus right is just one so if you divide 1.3 upon 1 you just get 1.3 right so if you multiply 17 into 1.3 you'll get roughly around 22 so that is what is impedance matching that times 22 times it has been multiplied the sound has been multiplied so that there is no difference from the conduction from the air medium towards the liquid medium that is your endolymph or the perilymph right so that is your impedance matching now as you can see here this is the basilar membrane right now one of the main important things is that the base of the cochlea is going to uh, be like responsible for high frequency whereas the apex is going to be responsible for low frequency now what do i mean by that is that let's say this eraser it's it's thick right so let's say the basilar membrane is of this size in the base of the cochlea so i would need a harder frequency or harder force to move the eraser so that it can move right so more the frequency is required to move this thick base uh, thick basilar membrane right whereas in the apex it's like a paper right it's like a paper so less frequency is required or less force is required to move it so in the apex less frequency is required whereas in the base more frequency is required or it is responsive to that and now what happens is that because of the movement of this basilar membrane like this right it is moving like this if the so sound is coming then the basilar membrane is going to get displaced like this and the hair hair bundles which are attached to the tectorial membrane are also going to get like moved or displaced right so because of this movement the hair cells get depolarized or stimulated and then because of this the stimulation goes from the nerve fibers towards the brain and then we receive the signal of the sound now let's talk about the auditory pathway now the auditory pathway can be learned easily with the help of a mnemonic known as e colima e colima now from the cochlea for the e stands for eighth nerve right the vestibular cochlea for this it's the cochlear part so the eighth nerve that is for e c for cochlear nuclei right o for olivary complex superior olivary complex and l for lateral nucleus of lateral lumenisci i for inferior colliculus m for medial geniculate body and a for auditory cortex so this is how it is transferred from the cochlea towards the auditory cortex and that is area 41 so that is the system for the auditory now let's move on to the vestibular system now the vestibular system consists of the three semicircular canal and the utricle and the sacul right so the semicircular canals has an ampullated and ampullated and meaning that it is dilated like it is uh, broadened so now one has one side is ampullated whereas the other side is normal now you would imagine that the three semicircular canals should be having six ends but that is not the case why is that is because the superior and the posterior semicircular canal share a common non-ampulated end okay it is a non-ampulated end so 
they share a common end and it is known as the crux commune so the common ending is known as the crux commune and now the special sensory organ for the vestibular system inside the semicircular canal is known as the criste right whereas in the utricles and the saccules it's called the macula okay maculae or macula so now let's go one by one to the criste and the macula so as you can see here this is the criste and this is the macula let's first talk about the criste so this is the hair cells which is present on the ampullated end right this is the hair cells and these are the hair bundles which are providing by the hair cells and the criste has a structure known as capilla on which the hair bundles are projected on so if this capilla moves then the hair bundle also moves and this leads to the stimulation of the hair cells so it actually depends on the movement of the capilla actually so the endolymph which is going to be moved right so it is going to move the capilla and because of it it is going to move the hair cells and depolarization will take place as you can see in this picture like say suppose if a person is rotating right if a pers person is rotating at a axis then what will happen is that the endolymph will start flowing towards that direction right and then it will displace the capilla and it displaces the hair cell and again it will produce depolarization and conduction of the nerve so uh, let's take an example if this is the lateral semicircular canal this is the left side and this is the right side right so let's say a person is rotating towards the right side right so this is the ampullated end so if this is the ampullated end then this must be having the capilla and the hair cells right so a person is rotating towards the right then the endolymph direction of flow will be on the right side like this right and it will carry on with this rotation until and unless the person stops let's say the person has stopped now because of inertia it the flow of the endolymph will still carry on so because of this flow it is moving away from the right side but it is coming towards the left side right so it is ampullo petal for this left side whereas it is ampullo fugal for the right side so petal meaning towards and fugal meaning away from it right so the vertigo direction of the vertigo will be towards the left side so and the direction of the vertigo is always opposite to the direction of the flow of the endolymph right and the direction of the vertigo is always onto the fast component so meaning like if the eye is moving like this and then this so this and then this it's moving from the right side towards fastly towards the left side right so that means the fast component is on the left side and this means that the vertigo is left side okay so now moving on to the structure of the maculae so this is the macula right so the macula has cells which are type 1 and type 2 cells okay so the, those are the cells which are present in the maculae and the maculae has a membrane like structure known as the otolith and it has crystals okay calcium crystals on it so the hair bundles are going to be attached on the otolith and then when the otolith is going to be like moving or displaced then these hair cells will get stimulated again and it will send the signal so that is the structure of the maculae so the maculae is present in the utricle and the saccule and it is mainly for the acceleration the acceleration and vertical movements right whereas the semicircular canals that is the criste is for angular movements angular detection of the angular movements okay and because sometimes if this otolith gets displaced and sometimes it goes to the posterior semicircular canal uh, that is most commonly okay so it is known as the b p p v benign proximal positional vertigo so positional because it is uh, posterior positional so it produces vertigo so that is one of the main things and this b p v uh, PV is going to be uh, I mean it can be treated with the help of a place maneuver so this a place maneuver really what it does is it really tries to uh, it just tries to bring back the otolith which has been displaced from the maculae towards the posterior semicircular canal and bring this back towards the place where it belongs so that is the uh, uh, the function of the a place maneuver and it usually works 
so that is one of the clinical uh, importance for this uh, structure so that is all for today thank you